everybody who's on the call today. Um, uh, on behalf of the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, I welcome all of you uh, to an amazing session that we have partnered with uh, and FGM Canada Network. Uh, and really, it was a couple of months ago that I heard Awada presenting in another session. Uh, and although I had heard of FGMC, uh, which is female genital mutilation and cutting uh, back home, I'm from India, and the practice uh, is quite prevalent there. Uh, I myself was surprised to learn that, you know, this practice is uh, not only well, but it's thriving in Canada as well. So today's session is really uh, in partnership with NFGM Canada Network to get a better understanding uh, on the issue of FGMC, uh, but also in the Canadian context, right? Like what are the Canadian laws uh, and, and practices around it? And um, uh, we also want to know how can we be allies uh, to advocate against uh, this practice? How can we come together as groups of women and, 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 and people who kind of fight against this injustice uh, and I, I would say a criminal act um, against <clears throat> women. Uh, so I welcome Varda, uh, Varsame, and uh, Blessing today from the end uh, FGM Canada Network who will lead us through the session. Uh, we also have some of our team members, so our executive director, Nuzah Jaffrey, is here. Uh, Umema, who will help us uh, with forwarding the slides if needed, uh, and Iman. So thank you, Varda, and Blessing for being here. I will hand it over to Umema to just take us through the land acknowledgement. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to do a brief land acknowledgement. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is, new, is now a home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. The territories within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto, also known as Tuckeronto, is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to work on this land. I will now pass it on to Varda to lead today's session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Omaima, and thank you, Firdos, and all of you for coming on this wonderful, sunny, warm, and fuzzy Friday evening to talk about a pretty heavy topic. Um, so I'm really appreciative of the time that you're giving me and us. Um, Omaima covered actually the land acknowledgement. Um, a lot of times when I do these presentations, I do it with organizations that are um, from across the nation. So um, I'm from Mississauga, so I'm covered by Omama's land acknowledgement. I just want to add, um, I'm from Somali background, and like a lot of us that come from countries that have been previously colonized, I like to kind of like enter um, uh, an additional perspective into the land acknowledgement. It's like we have that experience with colonialism, and then the colonialism that happened in the Americas on Turtle Island is settler colonialism. And we are continuing in that tradition. We're continuing on that history. So I consider myself a settler on stolen land, specifically I'm from Mississauga. So um, the um, the people whose lands I'm on are the Mississaugas of the first credit. So um, that's like my little addition to the land acknowledgement. Okay. So um, I'm from an organization called End FGM Canada Network. We are a young organization, about three years old. Um, we are a small, mighty team. Um, one of my colleagues is here with me, Blessing. And then we have three more colleagues. Most of us are part-timers and only two of us are full-time. So the amount of work that we do and the amount of work that we've done, it's a little overwhelming, um, but I truly and all of us truly believe in what we are doing. Um, so as an organization, Oops. Yeah, so sorry, I skipped the agenda. So let me give you the agenda for the night. So at first I will introduce us and FGM Canada Network. I will tell you about what is female genital mutilation and all the W questions, right? Like why is it performed? When is it performed on all of that? And then we'll talk about the Canadian context. And then I will end um, the evening with a call to action for all of you. So, and FGM Canada Network, we are a nonpartisan group of individuals 
and organizations working to end uh, female genital mutilation slash cutting and to support survivors both in Canada and abroad. What that means is that we do a lot of education, um, a lot of education, advocacy, and kind of like um, we're trying to get into the uh, policy sphere as well. So when I say education, we have noticed um, one of the ways that we've decided to tackle this problem is by educating professionals on what FGMC is so that they will be able to support their clients, their patients, whatever that professional relationship might look like within the parameters of um, their profession. So a lot of times I get contacted for professions, professionals from you know many, many different fields. So say for example, um, uh, a therapist will contact me because for the first time in their life, they have an FGMC survivor that they're working with and they have no idea what to do. So they're trying to refer them to us to do frontline work with them, right? As an organization, we don't do frontline work. There are a lot of, um, there are few, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are a few other organizations across the nation that do provide frontline services to FGMC survivors, but the demand is higher than what's available. So this is where we're trying to come in. We're trying to educate professionals from all across so that they will be able to support the, uh, the survivors that connect with them so that they have the competency, the language, you know, the sensitivity to be able to support this person without um, adding further harm, right? Um, so our mission is to be a leading force in Canada to end all forms of FGMC, working collab collaboratively with stakeholders to increase awareness, strengthen, uh, strengthen measures to protect the girls at risk, and aid in the creation of systems of support for impacted women and girls. So the systems of support is something that we are trying to focus on. And this is like, you know, where the education comes in. So here I am tonight uh, speaking to all of you. Um, later on, I will ask you, you know, your professional um, backgrounds, but my hope here is that you will be a beacon to carry that that torch forward right you know you're going to learn a bit more about fgmc i will direct you to further resources to you know increase your knowledge but also sorry give me a second Okay, <laughs> working from home. I'm trying to figure out boundaries with my kids. They just barged in and it's like, ah, get out, but I'm back. So um, something that we like to create and we're focusing on is that systems of support, right? Um, we want to increase the people in Canada who have the capacity to support FGMC survivors. Um, like when it comes to like, say for example, gynecologist, there is one, that I can refer people to in Canada, right? Um, we have had we have had stories, and I know even from my own personal life, um, people who have gone to seek help. You know, whether it's like you know it was them going to a therapist or a midwife or you know you name it, the profession, and then that harm that came out of that interaction was greater than any of the benefits, right? So this is where we're like to undo some damage. So our, uh, our vision is a Canada free of FGMC where impacted women and girls are well supported and girls at risk are protected. That's our vision. Okay, um, we are a network organization. We are a membership based organization. So our members are people like you and organizations like CCMW. So at the end of the night, I will have a call to action for you and my call to action or part of that call to action will be for you to join us and become a member as an individual and as organizations. It gives us power. It gives us, you know, um, that oomph that we need to be like, these are the numbers that we have behind us. You know, this is the number of people who are um, advocating against FGM in Canada, FGMC in Canada. Right. So this will be I'll come back to this as part of my call to action for all of you. Um, so as an organization, like I said, we provide training to professionals 
on the context of FGMC in Canada and how to provide culturally sensitive, trauma-informed support to impacted communities and individuals. Another um, program that we have is the Survivors Fund. So, you know, when donors donate money to us, we put it aside in this fund. So it's like whenever we have um, um, FGMC survivors who are seeking therapy and counselors, um, we are able to pull from that fund and connect them with therapists. The issue that we have, again, is like, you know, um, the lack of individuals in that field who I can refer people to, right? So it's like, if you know any therapist and you feel like they'd be a good fit, please connect them with me. I would like to take them through the training and then hopefully we can add them to the roster and there will be an additional resource that we can connect people to. So a lot of the work that we're trying to create or trying to do is creating those infrastructures. Okay, so this is an opportunity for me to hear from you. Have you heard of FGMC before? For those told us at the beginning of how she heard of FGMC, and I would like to hear from other people. So have you heard of FGMC before? And what was the context? And I, I would love to know what brought you to this workshop tonight. I can go first. It's Nuzhat. Please, yeah. So um, I guess it's been many years now, but we did, ha we did have research done mm -hmm. on this uh, subject. And um, at that time, it was one of the people who was, you know, very, um, she was doing work in this, she was doing uh, academic work on the topic, and she had interviewed survivors and community members who had experienced it or, you know, mm -hmm. who were concerned about it. And um, in many instances, the, the uh, um, people interviewed said that, you know, they were taken from Canada to get the procedure done and then they came back and they experienced a lot of you know health care issues afterwards uh, but it's so the topic of FGM FGC is not new to CCMW mm -hmm. uh, in fact we had had we did information sessions like the one we're doing today but I was saying to for the Austin team earlier there are lots and lots of chapter members in CCMW who are new and they haven't heard these presentations before. So we are really grateful to you um, for presenting today and also um, looking forward to the call to action to see how we can support you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, for those, the, I think, I believe after the first meeting that we've had, you shared the study that you've done with us. Um, it was very thorough. Thank you so much for giving us the space and the platform to come in and talk to people. Uh, Farida and then Yasmin. Yes, salam alaikum. Uh, I heard of FGMC in Montreal. I mean, FGM in Montreal. Mm -hmm. um, also, we had a, two, two French Canadian Quebecois women who met with us, CCMW Montreal, way back when because they wanted to stop this happening in Canada. They uh, met with us in a group of also African women, uh, Canadian women of African origin, mainly from West Africa, mm -hmm. because they were uh, concerned that parents are still taking their young daughters away from Canada to have this done in their country of origin, yeah. even without the girl's permission. Now, what I want to know is if you will talk about this, because what was brought up also in that conversation, and I remember it very well, mm -hmm. was that there are many Quebecois women who do willingly undergo what you call female genital, I don't know if you can call it mutilation or operation. Mm -hmm. and these two women would, were telling us that this is on a uh, willingness basis, meaning that is acceptable because those adults choose to do it, whereas mm -hmm. female genital mutilation with, with teenage girls is not acceptable because they are being done more as a culture. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't know if you will address that uh, in your talk, that there are women who actually do undergo this kind of operation here, mm -hmm. but we were- As adults. It. As a dozen, we were told that yeah. that's quite okay, but uh, it's not okay for young teenage women. Yeah. Um, so I thought, I don't know if you know French, it's like deux poids deux mesures. 
um, uh, I don't know, maybe you will address it later. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't speak French, but um, we, I, I, mm, the, uh, the adults getting the procedure done on themselves is not something that we cover particularly. The only thing that I can say is that um, there have been doctors that would perform, were performing infibulation, and I will talk about what that is later. It's like essentially when um, the, the, the labia majora, the labia minora is removed, and then whatever is left is sewn together, infibulation. So it's like there were doctors that were performing infibulation after childbirth in, in the United Kingdom, and that's illegal, right? So that's like the only thing that I know. Um, but yeah, I guess I can come back to that. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you for those notes, Farida. Yasmin? Hi, Varda. Thank you so much for hosting this session. So um, I've heard of FGM because I was born and raised in the Middle East. And I know that it's uh, very prevalent in a lot of North African nations and some Middle Eastern nations as well. Mm -hmm. um, but what was shocking for me is that later on in like as an ad, like in the last uh, couple of years, I decided to become a sexuality coach for uh, North African and Arab women in particular to focus on pleasure and the importance of redefining and changing the narrative around sexuality. And that's when I actually came across the data and uh, figured out how prevalent it is and how high the numbers are. So I'm really um, proud of you for running this workshop and super excited to be part of your call to action because this is something that I am personally passionate about. And I think this is something that really needs to be addressed for a lot of like Arab and Muslim women. But even though even the ones who are not necessarily impacted firsthand, this is something that impacts us all. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to connect with you afterwards. Your yeah. work sounds very interesting and we seem to be very well aligned. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. So a lot of what I'm hearing is that FGMC is something that um, you've heard of. You might not have a lot of in-depth knowledge about it, but it's something that for a lot of us is part of the culture. And honestly, like this resonates when I speak to my family, for example, like, you know, my sisters, cousins, even my friends. Um, we know of FGMC maybe a little bit more than um, what I would call like, you know, the general Canadian population, right? But even when that, and even with that, we might not have a lot of in-depth knowledge about, you know, the whys and the hows and, you know, um, what evidence people use to even support this practice. So hopefully I'll get into a little bit more of that. So like you'll have a more context. Okay. So we have a project called the Joining Hands. Um, like I said at the very beginning, what we are trying to do is to educate professionals so they'll be able to support survivors and at-risk girls within the parameters of their professions, right? So it's like our, our, our thinking is that the more people that know FGMC, the more structures and the more supports that will be available to impacted women and girls. What we know um, anecdotally is that there are about 100,000 survivors in Canada and potentially thousands of girls at risk, right? Um, when it comes to, um, like when we compare ourselves as a nation, Canada, to our peers, whether that is like either the United States or different countries in Europe or even Australia and New Zealand, so like the Western nations, we are really lacking or lagging behind in services, um, in data about FGMC, in all of that, right? So when I say 100,000 survivors in Canada, this is an anecdotal, we don't have the hardcore data, we haven't done that work yet as a nation, right? And this is something that um, NDFGM Canada is hoping to do with partners in the community as well down the line. But for now, what we are doing is this, the Joining Hands project. So already right now we have the first module, which is the foundation module live. So if you go to our website, um, ndfgm.ca, under training, you will find the foundation module. We have it both in French and in English. So it focuses on uh, what FGMC is, um, and it kind of brings that Canadian perspective. It's um, a, a more in-depth of the presentation that I'm giving you tonight, right? So some pieces of what I'm presenting to you tonight were pulled actually 
from the foundation module. Um, and then we have other modules coming up. Some of them are almost there and others, hopefully they'll be ready like sometime in the fall. So we have a module for teachers and educators, K to 12. So like, you know, we're trying to get them to understand what FGMC is and how to support um, girls at risk, right? How to be able to um, flag some of the risks. And then we have one for medical professionals. So like I said, from what I know, there is about one gynecologist that I can refer people to. There might be a few more in Quebec, but for Ontario and like English speaking, I only know one, right? And even she herself, she is currently training. Um, I, I think she said two other doctors. So she's like doing this on her own. And when I say um, one doctor I can refer people to, I mean, you know, like in terms of reconstructive surgeries, right? Um, and a lot of even the work that she's doing, it's not covered by OHIP. So like there's so many things that, or so much work that needs to get done for us to get to a place where survivors can be fully supported. So if there's a survivor here in Canada who wants to go through the reconstructive surgery, they don't have a lot of options. And a lot of them, what happens is that they go to places like in the, you know, different clinics in the United States, or they even go to clinics in different parts of Africa or Europe, right? And then now you have that issue of continuity of care. So we're trying to educate medical professionals, not on the reconstructive surgery piece, but just on understanding what, F what FGMC is and how to support a person who came to your clinic. Um, I'll tell you a story at this point, because it's it fits. So I have a friend, this is years ago, she was um, pregnant, had a midwife, this is her first baby. So she, um, I believe it was like her first or second appointment. But anyways, during that appointment, she discloses to the midwife that um, A, I was raped as a child, so it's like, you know, I might need additional support um, and I have had FGMC, right? So when it came to the rape, the midwife wasn't like, oh, what is that? You know, and nothing like that because she knew what, what that meant and how to support her in that context. But when it came to the FGMC conversation, my friend literally had her phone out and they were Googling together what FGMC is. And like, you know, they were going through um, the information that they're finding online. So here is my friend who is, you know, with her medical care provider explaining and educating on what FGMC is, right? That is not really an appropriate, um, it's, not a, it's not the place of the patient to be educating their healthcare provider, right? And the thing that is interesting is like, okay, my friend actually had that capacity. And when she's telling me, we're both laughing about it because we thought like, okay, this is like ludicrous, right? But she had the capacity to be able to do that. Not every patient, not every survivor will have that capacity, right? So for us, this is our thinking. So the medical professional is like, the, the module for medical professionals is not training them on how to do medical procedures, but rather on understanding what FGMC is and how to treat and work with FGMC survivors from a culturally sensitive trauma-informed lens. And again, like all of our uh, modules are being developed in conjunction or like in support of subject matter experts. Likewise, we also have a mental health um, module that is coming up. This is geared towards therapists, psychologists, psychotherapists, and counselors, right? Same, same lens, same understanding. And then there's the other one for child protection services. So this one is protecting at-risk girls. So, you know, when it comes to like border patrol um, officers or, you know, child welfare um, agencies, it's like, how do you flag? What do you do in the cases that something happens? There's a story that recently happened. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. This happened in Quebec about two weeks ago. Um, there was a child that in daycare, the two daycare, two daycare workers while changing her diaper thought, okay, um, something is amiss here. This child might have gone through FGMC, right? This child's clitoris might have been removed. So as is the procedure, they contacted the youth, youth protection services in Quebec. So like child aid services kind of, right? Youth protection services. Youth protection services responds by saying, this matter is too delicate for us. So 
now you have the two childcare workers who have gone through the right channels and feel like they've been let down and the child that is under their care has been let down by the agency that was supposed to, you know, investigate, right, and take over the case. Their only avenue was to go to the media. And that's how the story broke. They went to the media, an article was published. Um, the Quebec Human Rights Commission took over the case and started doing investigation. I don't understand how they fit in because from my understanding, that's not their role. But anyways, what happened is that the Youth Protection Services ended up doing a proper investigation and the child was found, nope, nothing, like she didn't go under F uh, FGC, right? She didn't go through FGM or FGC. So it was like, okay, that's great. I'm genuinely happy for that child, right? But for me, I find this very alarming because for a couple of reasons, like the organization that is supposed to have that check and balances when it came to child abuse felt that this was too much for them. And why do they feel that this is too much for them? Well, it could be a few things. It's like often it's like lack of understanding, um, being um, cautious of like, you know, not interfering in people's culture, right? All of those things. Um, and then for me, I find that the fact that now this story is out there and you have child, the child, the Youth Protection Services Agency saying this is too delicate for us. In my head, this sends a message, right? This sends a message to any other people who might be considering doing that procedure to their kids. So with our training, we're hoping that no professional will be in a situation where they are unsure of where they stand when it comes to FGMC. Like it's Can illegal. Just, um, sorry, go ahead. Very quickly, and I'm sorry. To no. I did hear of the case. Yes, it went on the media. Mm -hmm. uh, just to let you know, a child protection agency, the French one, which is uh, the PJ, Department de la Protection de la Jeunesse, sometimes the caseworker has so much load that if it's a, a culturally sensitive and delicate, they are not equipped because they don't have the formal training, and that is part of the problem. Yeah, wow, that is, that's a bigger problem than, um, yeah, that's very, that's very problematic. Thank you for adding that, Farida. <clears throat> yeah, so like, so for us, we, we want, we don't want, like there's so many things. What we don't want communities to be policed. We don't want communities to be stigmatized because when it comes to FGMC, this is a reality, right? Sometimes when we talk about FGMC in the West, there's a lot of othering and there's a lot of stigmatization, a lot of finger pointing and racializing FGMC. We don't want that. At the same time, we want to have structures in place to prevent FGMC from happening and to have supports for the survivors, All right? So, okay, so I've been talking a lot so far about and saying FGMC, FGMC. What is FGMC in itself, right? So I'm going to have an image and this image can be triggering. It could be, um, it is gr a graphic um, image. I will show you the female genital genitalia and what happens in FGMC. So I will leave this up to your discretion. Maybe you want to minimize the screen or maybe you want to step out of the meeting and then come back. It'll take me maybe four minutes or so. So I'll leave this up to you. We're ready to go. Okay. So FGMC or female genital mutilation involves the partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genitalia organs, genital organs for non-medical reasons. So there are different ways, different cultures um, practice FGMC um, and sometimes it's a mix of all of these. So the top one is the normal genitalia. This is what it looks like, right? What happens in type one, the clitoridectomy, is that the clitoris is removed. So the parts that are removed are in blue, kind of bluish gray, if you can like see in the picture. So this is the part that would be removed in the clitoridectomy, right? So this would be the clitoris. In type two, it would be the, clito uh, the, the clitoris and the labia minora. And then in type three, 
uh, the the major the labia majora, the labia minora, and the clitoris would be removed. And then you have this uh, infibulation, this sewing happening. And it could be mixes of any of these things. Um, you can have type three without the infibulation. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so the health impacts of FGMC. Well, the short term is like there's that severe pain, problems with urination, the retention of urination, damage to the urethra and maybe the anus, infections and death. And death happens either because of infections or bleeding. Um, and then you have the immediate health risk increases with type three because type three is very severe, right? Here, the infibulation. Um, and then because usually it's done on children, you have the traumatic response because children are usually held down while the procedure is being performed, right? Long-term, again, psychological, like, you know, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, maybe other mood disorders, um, feelings of detachment from your body, um, avoiding situations and people that remind you of the situation, flashbacks, all of that, right? Um, obstetrical problems could be painful uh, scar tissue that tears during childbirth, um, increased risk of stillbirths and higher neonatal mortality and maternal mortality. Gynecological and reproductive issues can also happen like chronic pain um, because nerve, nerves are damaged, um, chronic pelvic infections, development of cysts, abscesses, um, ulcers, painful urination. So all of these could be like lifelong problems that happen um, and then issues with sexual uh, with sexual pleasure and painful with intercourse right um, infertility can happen and difficulty with menstruation any questions or comments so far how are we how are we feeling so far give me a thumbs up if you're okay or so so okay Thank you. That makes me think that all the acts of violence uh, for some reason are really perpetuated to women and girls, you know, uh, I'm yeah. sure that uh, impacts boys as well in, in different forms, yeah. but really that we are such soft targets, uh, you know, uh, I, like I said, I've been a, in, in India, I was in a convent and uh, there was someone from the Bora community. I, I may have been in grade four or five maybe, mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't know much about the practice, but this girl was actually sick throughout the school year and then she left so I, I don't know what, what happened to her if she even survived it yeah. but this is so heinous and uh, which is why I felt so strongly when I heard you talk and I said we must come together to do something about it yeah it is a heinous um, practice and it's, it's it has zero health benefits um, and it does have lifelong negative impacts it is a practice that is rooted in patriarchy it is an ancient practice. My version of it, for me, I'm Somali, and my version of it, we trace it back to the time of ancient Egyptians, right? So it's like a very, something that as a species we've been doing for such a long time that does not make sense because it doesn't have any health benefits. And if anything, it has way too many negative impacts. Um, and this, yeah, sorry, go ahead, it's me. Uh, I had a question about, like, I know in the stats, they'll just say the percentages, but do you know which one is the most common out of the three types? I don't. And the reason why, um, the reason why is that for me personally, I think like, at least in my part of um, the world that practice it, honestly, it's all of them are practiced, right? Okay. So for us, traditionally, this is the one that we used to practice, the infibulation, right? So this yeah. is like my mother's generation, my grandmother's generation, right? Yeah. And before that, um, yeah, and blessing is adding, it depends on the country and the ethnic group. So okay. for us, we've been moving away from infibulation to these. And what's happening actually is that there's like a redefining of what FGM is. So this one they'll call FGM, and then the, the type one and type two, they'll call it as like female circumcision. Right. So it's yeah. like, yeah. So like in Somali, we don't obviously use the English terminology. We yeah. call this Firauni. Okay? okay. So like yeah. a pharaonic circumcision. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. oh, that's the bad one. 
these ones are okay. And then it's like, no, no, no. Okay. The, in, the excision one, the type two is bad because like, you know, you're removing too much. So let's just do the type one, the clitoridectomy. Right. Yeah. 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 And in Arabic, I think the term we use is tahara, which comes from cleanliness. That's we use for... the same one as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's hysterical. Blessing, do you want to come on, Mike? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. I, I'm not muted, right? Okay. No, no, no. So we can hear you. I'm from Nigeria, and the four types are practiced in Nigeria. Just that the type one, which is the clitoridectomy, is the one that is practiced most. And um, different parts of the country practice different types. So there are certain parts of the country that practice all four, you know, but mm -hmm. certain parts just choose, okay, some parts do the type one, some parts do the type three. And recently we're seeing an increase in type four which is the other types. Um, and that also falls under the medicalization. So we're seeing a lot of people say, okay, if you say it's harmful for the grandmothers to do it and the circumcisers, then we're going to take them to people who have medical experience like nurses and you know community health workers. So it depends on the country, to be honest, and it depends on the ethnic group. And we can also narrow it down to say it depends on the families. So we've seen instances where type one, which is the clitoridectomy, is practiced in a particular part of the country. But then some families take it a step further to say, you know what, maybe we should just do the infibulation. We feel that the infibulation will be more, more effective. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And all of this, like it's a mix and a mix match practice. So like here, what we have is like um, the sewing down of like the parts that were removed, right? Like I know that in Somalia, sometimes they don't do that. So it kind of falls here. So it's like, oh, we only pricked the clitoris or oh, we only shaved the labia minora, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like mix and matches. Why is it performed? So what is the rationale that people cite? Well, psychosocial people, you know, this is, a, like I said, it's a patriarchal practice. So to control women's sexuality, again, from like an East African perspective, we cite all these other reasons. And then when you push, it's like, oh, if you don't circum circumcise the girl, if she doesn't get FGMC, she'll be this wild, you know, girl that brings dishonor to the family and stuff like that. But you really get that after you push on the conversation, right? Um, so the other reasons is like, oh, it's a social norm. So it's like everybody gets it. Um, I'm going to use the word ebb. I don't know if everyone understands it, but like, you know, it's like if she doesn't get it, it's like it's a shame. You know, it's like um, like uh, you, you, you contradict the social norms. And therefore, just by doing something like something that isn't accepted by everyone, like it's shameful. Right. So that pressure of like doing it because everybody does it because it's part of the culture and it's part of being a woman, right? Um, a big one is the hygiene and the aesthetics pieces. So like when I said like, you know, the trimming or the shaving of the labia minora and the, the, the clitoris and the clitoridectomy, it's like, oh, those are ugly body parts and therefore the FGMC is performed to make it prettier, right? And then religion is a big one. Um, religion is interesting because neither Islam nor Christianity has any, um, there are no evidence from either of those religions that support FGMC. From an Islamic perspective, um, there's no, nothing in the Quran about FGMC. And the only thing in the Hadith is one week Hadith that is refuted by most Islamic scholars, right? So like all, most Islamic reputable Islamic organizations, so like whether this is Al-Azhar or we're talking about um, the Muftis in Saudi Arabia, it's like they recognize this hadith as a weak hadith. So the only reason why it's sort of accepted by Muslim scholars is like, okay, this is a practice that predates Islam. Islam came into communities that practiced it and it wasn't forbidden, right? So therefore, like there's that like tippy-toeing around it, right? But the one hadith that people cite is actually a weak hadith that is refuted. 
Okay, and then the socio there's a socioeconomic aspect to it. So because it's a cultural norm, it becomes um, a, a, a young woman has a challenge or like it becomes a challenging for a young woman to get married if she hasn't had FGMC, right? So it's like, this is connected to her dowry. This is connected to the family's honor and all of that, right? When and how is it performed? FGMC can happen at any age. However, it is usually performed between birth and 15 years of age. So it depends on the community. Uh, some communities perform it before puberty, at infancy or at puberty. Um, so for some, it's prior to marriage, and for some, it's you know um, during the first pregnancy. Um, I do know of some communities that practice the infibulation after each birth. Right, so like type three here after each birth. So it's like open up at birth and then sewing down. So what I was saying at the beginning, there was a, a doctor in the United Kingdom who was infibulating women after they had given birth. And this was adult women requesting this or their families requesting this. This was illegal and he had to deal with the, um, the ramifications of that, right? Um, in Canada, in the United States, infibulation is also illegal. So doctors cannot infibulate women, even at their request, right? I know, Omeima, it's wild. <laughs> okay, so the language, the terminology that we're using. Um, there is a debate in terms of like, what is the most appropriate terminology to use? Is it FGM or FGC? So is it female genital mutilation or is it female genital cutting? Um, personally, for me, I use whatever the survivor is using. So if you are in a professional space where you're working with a survivor, use the terminology that they're using. As an organization in our name, we have FGM, but when I'm speaking in a lot of our, not a lot, in all of our content, we use FGC, right, to kind of accommodate both. So I know of um, survivors that strongly identify with cutting and strongly do not want the mutilation to be used for them because they find that to be disrespectful, dehumanizing, stigmatizing their communities, all of that. And I don't disagree at all. Um, and then I also know survivors who strongly identify with the, this term mutilation. And they say, what was done to me is mutilation. So it's like, and again, I respect their choice of word, right? So for me, usually I just use FGMC. Um, I know even survivors that won't use any of this and will just say female circumcision, right? So it's like when I'm talking to that person, that's what I'm going to use. But like when I'm when we're creating content, we use FGMC, so female genital mutilation slash cutting. Just in case you are wondering all these different acronyms and like why I was using different versions of it. Okay, now I'm going to share the story of Marion again. Um, this could be triggering. It is the story of um, one of our previous board members. She is a survivor from Somali Kenyan. She's a Somali Kenyan from Kenya. Um, and she shared her story with us. She was heavily involved in the creation of the story. So like the animation, you will see um, a razor blade and you will see the razor blade with blood. So like, you know, that's the, the question that I'm going to give you. You won't see in any of our content the procedure being performed, um, even like in animation and things like that. But this is a heavy um, story and this is her story. So again, I'm giving you that, you know, that warning. I grew up in rural northeastern Kenya. I was brought up to believe that every girl had to go through Gudninka Gabdaha, female genital mutilation. I was told it was part of Islam and a must do for every girl. When my time came, I was terrified about the impending pain, but I still looked forward to it. That's the kind of brainwashing that takes place. I was only six years old when it happened. I still remember that day. The sharp cut, the unbearable pain, the aftermath. 
I went through infibulation. They closed everything up and left only a tiny opening. I recall the pain during the grueling three-hour journey home after that day in the bush. We had to shuffle through the hot sand because our legs were tied from the thighs to the toes. I remember the fear two weeks later when the cutter came to check her handiwork. I knew I would be cut if I was not closed enough. At university, I met a young Muslim woman. She had not been mutilated. That is how I learned that female genital mutilation has no basis in Islam. When I had my own daughter, Khadija, I was determined she would not be cut. But the pressure on girls is enormous. Relatives told her that if she wasn't cut, she would be ugly. That she would grow organs that look like the fangs of snakes and that she would smell bad. I was so worried they would cut her behind my back. When my mom asked me, what will you do if your daughter was cut? That was a wake up call. And that's why I brought her to Canada. I could save her from the physical cut, but not from the shaming. When I arrived in Canada from Kenya, I was shocked to realize there is silence about female genital mutilation here, that there is a fear of offending other people's rights, traditions, and religion. As a survivor, I want to tell Canadians that they are welcome to condemn female genital mutilation. Nobody deserves to be taken through this pain that affects you for life. We need Canada's silence on female genital mutilation to end, so girls can be protected and survivors supported. And we need that silence to end now. Thank you. Any thoughts or comments or questions after hearing Marion's story? From the Ghanaian women, I got to speak with uh, or who told their story at that meetings all those years ago mm -hmm. um they were they mentioned that this is such an age-old custom that they are uh, uh they stigmatized when they don't have it done so basically they are considered outcasts if they don't have that uh, female uh genital they are considered outcasts they are considered not good for marriage um, and uh, if sometimes the grandmother goes behind the mother's back and gets it done. So this is what I heard. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, like I know statistics wise in Somalia, it says that it's 98%. And I don't understand how that is the truth. Because as far as I know, anyone in Somalia I'm talking about, um, for me, it's like, it's close to a hundred percent. So it's like the two, two percent will be like thousands of women who haven't undergone FGMC. And to me, it's like, like, it's unheard of for us, you know? So yeah, it's big part of the culture. It's big, big part of the culture. And what Marian is talking about, you know, her mother taking her child behind her back. It's like, unfortunately, this is something that is done out of love right for the child so that she doesn't have to deal with these social consequences but then you you are exchanging the social consequences for the physical consequences the health consequences the psychological consequences um so for us and our work we would like it to be kind of like a bottom-up approach where we're not policing communities and like you know legislating things and things like that where like the change comes from within and when i look at it from a canadian context communities that practice FGMC when they come to Canada, they don't significant number. Uh, sorry, how do I phrase this? Most of them do not practice FGMC because the incentive of like that pressure, that social norm drops dramatically, right? So like, again, like from a Somali context, most Somalis here do not practice FGMC. You still have families and you still hear every once in a while of like, you know, this family that took their child from Canada 
as part of vacation cutting, that's what it's called, and took them back home or any of the Middle Eastern countries that practice it and had it done over there and then they would come back, right? But then like the community looks at them like, what is wrong with you if they're public about it? And for the most part, they're actually not public about it at all. So it's like a very hush hush thing that is done kind of like in the background because they know that they don't have that social support here that they would have had back home. It's rather the opposite. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I would like to add, like, I like what you said about it takes uh, changing the individuals as opposed to the legislation. And because I, I don't know about Somalia, but I know, for example, in Egypt, the practice is banned and yet the numbers are still increasing. So yeah. I think it's more of a cultural issue than it is uh, a political or, like you said, legislation. So the it definitely comes to the individuals and the communities that we live in. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. It's illegal in Somalia. Oh. Not only like it's funny in Somalia, it's illegal by the federal government, and then we have like regional governments. So every single one of the regional governments has it also illegal, right? So like, say something like Canada says it's illegal, and then Ontario says it's illegal, and yet it's still practiced at mm -hmm. an almost hundred percent. So that's how like ingrained it is in the culture, despite mm -hmm. the fact that there's no religious um, reasons for it. You know, there are no health benefits for it. To me, it's wild, but that's the reality of FGMC. Yeah. Yeah. I think in Egypt is something like 87% or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I was very surprised. Uh, I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize the numbers were that high. Yeah. 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 So Varda, just a question. I'm totally a person against criminalization, but I think sometimes that is the only recourse that you have to save our young girls who are at risk. Uh, so I'm sure you'll cover it, but you know, what are the legal repercussions, you know, mm -hmm. for people either who are practicing or who are allies by way of like doctors or nurses? Uh, is this something that is punishable by law? A little bit that you can, mm -hmm. if I'm too early, you can address it when you need to. It's okay. We can come back to the rest, but yeah, it's illegal in Canada. It has been illegal since 1997 with the possible sentence of up to 14 years in prison, right? But we haven't had any prosecutions, despite the fact that we know uh, anecdotally again of FGMC happening to uh, Canadian girls, right, as part of vacation cutting or um, them going to places like in the United States or even Europe and then coming back, right? Um, so what is specifically illegal is like performing female genital mutilation on any child and professionals who work with children have the duty to report. Right. So that's why that case in Quebec was like, like, it's very alarming for me because that is one of the uh, checks and balances when it comes to interfering and now being involved in your family and losing your child, you know, that way. Right. So it's like, yeah, like there's a, um, a ball, the ball has been dropped in that case for me. Um, going back. So where is FGMC performed? FGMC is a global practice. Um, it's performed in 92 countries around the world. It's performed in every single continent except Antarctica. It's performed by most cultures. Um, and then like, you know, the interesting part for me, and I didn't know this until actually I came to work for NFGM, it was performed in, in Europe and in, like in Western countries as part of Western culture. So in the United Kingdom, it was performed um, until the 1950s to treat hysteria and masturbation. Um, in the United States, in our website, we have the stories of, I believe, two women, um, Caucasian white women from Christian families or Christian communities who have had FGMC done to them when they were kids. And specifically what they had was the clitoridectomy type one, right? So it's like their clitoris was removed to treat masturbation and to kind of like make the girl tame they didn't know i believe um one of them i was watching her story she didn't know what happened to her. she knew something happened to her but she didn't fully understand what happened until she connected with um women from practicing communities who have come to the to the united states and were talking about their fgmc experience and then she was able to connect the dots and be like oh this is what happened to me so she goes back to her own community and like her own family and friends. And she talks about this thing that happened to them when they were young kids. And they're like, oh yeah, it happens. But like, 
don't talk about it and kind of like keep it hush hush right so all of this is like very reminiscent of everything else that we know from our part of the world right like somalia or egypt or like you know across mina the the middle east and north africa region so it's like that hush hush practice to control a woman's sexuality um to, to make her tame all of that it's a global practice so the problem with the conversation uh, sorry the problem with the conversations around fgmc is the racialization of FGMC. Like I said, it's a global practice, it's an ancient practice, and it doesn't really belong to any one specific culture or religion. Any questions or comments about that so far? Okay. So if you are in a professional space where um, you might be working with young people. What are some of the risk factors for you to keep in mind? Um, family history. And I would say um, if their peers in their immediate family or extended family have undergone FGMC, I would consider that to be um, an increase, right? So it's like if, if I'm working with a young person and they're talking about their cousin or, you know, um, their sister or their friend who recently had this procedure done, then I would consider it, you know, an additional risk. And I would consider this child to be at an additional risk, I should say, because this is now something that is happening and perhaps normalized within this family. Um, and then the other one is children are increased risk if it is perceived to bring family honor or is seen as a requirement by the community. So again, if like the child is talking about it or the family is talking about it in a way where, no, this is part of our culture and like this is something that we have to do, then like this is like another red flag for me. Um, this one for me, it's kind of like a question mark because it can mean so many different things, but like limited integration into Canadian society might be another risk, right? Depending on what that, what that might look like especially like if it comes with the other first two uh, risk factors. And then again, removal from sex education is another question mark. We know that a lot of families remove their kids for a lot of different reasons, right? So it's like, this might be a reason for the child not to know what um, their anatomy would look like, right? Um, so again, this is, might be another added risk, but again, like um, kind of keep it into perspective with everything else. Um, and then this one is not specific to the family, but like to us as a society, as Canadian society. So the culture of silence and silencing. So what we notice is that secrecy prevails in the diaspora communities that perform FGMC. So those outside these communities are reluctant to engage on the issue for fear of being called racist, for fear of being called racist, which further inhibits discussion on how to safeguard children. Um, in Canada, we have these kind of like two camps when it comes to the conversations around FGMC. Either just like the um, the child protection services in Quebec, oh, this is like a it's, this is too delicate, or this is too specific to one culture, or you know, like just being cautious of like not offending people. That's like one way that uh, Canadians have reacted to FGMC, and then the other way is the way that the conversation used to be carried on, especially like when I recall back in like in the early 2000s and like in the 90s, you know, very racialized, very, um, it comes like, you know, um, very stigmatizing, pointing fingers, calling it barbaric, all of that. When the story, the, when the Quebec story broke, it was reported by um, a journalist in, the, I believe it's called the Tribune. I can send the article to you guys later. Um, but then it was picked up by other media, um, media outlets and I was reading one of them and they were using the language that is like stigmatizing, calling it a barbaric practice. And like, again, that finger pointing, right? So it's because there are certain parts of the society, certain parts of um, the West that speak of FGMC in a stigmatizing way. There's another group that is like reacting to it the opposite and not wanting to engage for fear of offending. Right. And even like the controversy in the word FGM, for me, in my perspective, the way that I understand it is that this is what people are reacting to, including us, you know, the, from impacted communities, survivors, all of it. Right. It's like, oh, the mutilation word is kind of like 
taking um, the same energy or the same perspective as those people who are stigmatizing us. So, yeah. Okay, so this is another opportunity for me to hear from you. Um, have you previously worked with FGMC survivors? And do you feel confident and comfortable supporting FGMC survivors within the parameters of your profession? If you don't, what would you like to learn more about? What would you like to do to kind of like gain that confidence and like, yeah, like how can I support you? I think, Varda, that's a great question, but I, I just feel that, you know, in the risk factors that you mentioned, uh, sometimes we may, we may not be privy to all of that. So let's say, you know, it could be a closed door community or a family. So we may not have that information, whether it's a practice in their family or community. Mm -hmm. So are there any other ways to gauge the risk factor, especially among young girls, uh, maybe who are going to school or who are going to daycare? Uh, and like, basically, how can we be allies, you know, in, in that, uh, let's stop it before it happens, right? Like, uh -huh. um, and if I want to say, so I'm a teacher and I'm dealt mostly with 15, 16, 17 year olds. This is not a topic that comes up in the schools. Yeah. And uh, it's hard to gauge. So that's why I cannot say I have worked with FGM survivors. Those in close-knit communities will never speak up about it yeah so that means there's a lot of secrecy around it mm -hmm. and i don't want you to leave today's session with kind of like um i don't know like your spidey senses up and like looking at um impacted or racialized communities with like oh you know they might be practicing fgmc you know um like i come from a community that practices FGMC, but I know that here in Canada, we don't practice it in the numbers that um, might support like an elevated risk, if that makes any sense, you know? So it's like, if I was say a classroom teacher, I wouldn't expect most of my Somali students to be at risk or to have undergone FGMC. However, there's the potential that some of them might be at risk you know or like a few of them might be at risk and i don't know but what i can do is like kind of like um get to know the families get to know the community and like keep in the back of my mind um some of the risk factors that we talked about but also like build the relationship with my students right so it's like if they feel like they're in a situation where something is off a lot of times like you know children know so it's like families will say, oh, we're going back home because, you know, you haven't been behaving well. So it's like, we want to reconnect you with your culture and like, you know, yeah, think like things along those lines. So now the child is coming to you as an adult because you have that relationship. So they feel like they can confide in you, right? Um, I think Nuzhat and then Yasmin, and I see a comment. Yeah, I was just going to ask if, um... You know, when, when you uh, think about this in the communities where, um, you know, it, it's probably um, not, as you were saying, not practiced here because, you know, even um, though it's illegal in Somalia and other countries, it's still practiced there. But mm -hmm. is there, is the fact that it is illegal in Canada, is that a deterrent? Does it really matter? Because as you were saying, even though in those other countries it is illegal, it is still practiced. So what what is the what are the driving factors for it besides it being illegal? Um, is and you mentioned you know because of the cultural norms and the pressure from family and community you know for for the procedure to be done. Well, mm -hmm. if those pressures aren't there, um, is the criminalization a deterrent uh, in Canada? Let's say more than in other countries. You know, it's very similar to polygamy. Mm -hmm. You know, polygamy is illegal. I know it's not the same. It's not as traumatic. It's not as mm -hmm. horrific. But the fact is it can have socio-psychological, you know, effects mm -hmm. on the women and families. It's illegal, yet it's practiced It's practiced here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I, I know there are no parallels because of the, of the pain that yeah. this procedure causes. But... 
the psychological harms are there and mm -hmm. it's actually practiced quite openly you know because there's no prosecution yeah <coughs> yeah yeah so when it comes to fgmc um here in canada the 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 the, the illegalization of it was definitely um from my perspective an incentive not to get it done at the beginning right so like when I think about, you know, the communities, like my background work-wise is working in the settlement sector. So, and then I'm Somali myself. So like, I remember the conversations that we were having in the nineties and the early two thousands when like, you know, a lot of Somali immigrants were coming to Canada and settling in Canada, right? It's like, they were coming with young children. So it was like, okay, we can get FGMC done because it's illegal and I'm going to lose my child, right? And you know, children's aid societies were involved in a lot of families' um, lives because of other things. So it's like they were they 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 felt that they, they were extremely invasive. So like you know, FG uh, sorry, uh, children's aid societies would be involved because you know the children were playing by themselves um, in the park downstairs, right? So it's like, oh, that's not appropriate way of supervising your children. You need to be physically with them. So it's like, okay, families felt like okay, these people are like extremely invasive. In, in the way that we raise our kids. So thinking about FGMC, it's like, they're gonna be way more involved than me just sending my child, my nine-year-old and eight-year-old to go downstairs and play in the park and get in trouble for that. So the, the, the illegalization of it, I do believe that it was an incentive for families not to do it, but it wasn't just that though. Also the fact that the pressure from the community wasn't there anymore, right? So it's like, the conversations that I remember is like, okay, you know, these are Canadian raised kids. Therefore, because they're Canadian raised kids, um, like the same expectations aren't there. And then now we have, you know, decades later, those kids who grew up who, who were here in the 90s and the 2000s are young adults, not, not even young, they're full blown adults who themselves are having kids, right? So the sky didn't fall. <laughs> this is, um, this is what I say, the sky didn't fall and people are realizing, nope, I have raised, you know, successful young people, um, you know, their sexuality wasn't a threat to us or their family, all of that, right? So it's like when they go back to their communities, whether it's back home, you know, over the phone or all of that, it's like, nope, the sky didn't fall. See, I didn't circumcise my daughter and my daughter is a normal, perfect, perfectly normal human being. So this kind of like resonates and kind of carries weight. So like now generationally, like um, just the work that I do, like when I connect with um, my, my sisters and my cousins and I'm asking them for survivors or like, you know, I get, I ask for their input about FGMC, like they're completely clueless because for them, it's like, why are we talking about this is really not relevant to us, right? Because like the circles that they're moving in is 100% for them not relevant, right? Except unfortunately, there's going to be those cases and I have seen them um, of young people who were taken from here back home as part of vacation cutting and then they came back, right? So it's like, but those young people's stories are not public. Therefore, it's kind of like a hush hush, but the majority of us, we haven't had this experience. If that makes any sense. Yes, mean. Yeah, um, I wanted to go back to your question earlier about uh, whether or not we've worked with the FGMC survivors. So I have not. And my question in terms of maybe help that I could get in this department is that I find with people who grew up in such communities, like even uh, like for me, I struggle to convince Muslim Arab women to be interested in their sexuality and pleasure and to look at it as some as part of like their wellness as a whole and it's not something that is dirty and taboo mm -hmm. and so my, my question is for someone who has gone through this procedure they are probably so disconnected or they probably the shame is way too heavy for them to even think of you know their bodies and being able to find a route to pleasure so how Maybe if you could provide some tips or resources on how uh, we could support survivors in in understanding the importance of connecting to their bodies mm -hmm. and finding different pleasure paths to access. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 
if this was like a check mark thing, I would say all of the above to what you said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do know of survivors that are exploring their sexuality and, you know, specifically when it comes to like pleasure. Um, recently, I watched a documentary. Um, she is from Quebec, but recently moved to Ontario. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm going to send it to you guys in the, um, I'll send it to Fredos and then she can share it with all of you. I believe it's called Big Sister. That's his English name, but it does have um, a French name, I think. So anyways, his documentary is, I think, three or four West African women who have undergone FGMC, you know, now living in Quebec, um, exploring, trying to reconnect with their sexuality. And a part of that for some of them is the reconstructive surgery and trying to navigate all of that. And then finding that, you know what, none, uh, there are no providers in Canada. So this was done like about a year and a half ago. So at that time, there were no providers to provide the reconstructive surgery, right? So it's like all of that. And then them choosing, some of them choosing to go to the US, some of them choosing to go to, I think one of them went to Ivory Coast. The other one was considering France. So it's like, okay, I'm going outside of the country and then I'm gonna come back because I have a life, I have a job and all of that. So now there's an issue of continuity of care and all of that, right? So um, yeah, I can I can forward the information about the documentary. And the other thing that I can connect you with is um, we have a researcher, I believe she's also from Quebec, doing research on FGMC survivors and their sexuality. That's all I really know. So I can send you, and they asked me to share the materials or like their research because they're looking for survivors, but maybe they would like to connect with you. Um, so, but to answer your question, personally, I don't have any tips, but what I do, what I can is like, I would love to connect with you and perhaps we can explore a way of like working all of this into maybe our programming or um, yeah, working some of the work that you do into our programming because, you know, sexuality and pleasure is a big part of um, the motivation behind why FGMC was done in the first place, right? So it's like reconnecting survivors to that aspect of their their body is super important. Yeah. Like if you see the the background behind me, like we are yeah. not a shy organization. I love that, and I like the name of your character, Miss Clitty. I thought yeah. that was smart. <laughs> We're very loud, yeah, and we that. and we believe that it's appropriate because yeah, it's appropriate. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So Varda, I had a question <clears throat> and really the sex education because I, I wasn't, I didn't mm. study here, but does it really cover FGM and C? Uh, and if not, I think like a push uh, because it may be happening to, uh, you know, uh, racialized communities, but I think people need to be aware, right? If kids are yeah. aware of their own sexuality, their own body, and more importantly, their own sexual rights, you know, as, as immigrants, when we come here, I didn't know about so many rights for many, many years. And yeah. this happened to me and I spoke to someone and said, oh, really? This can't be done in Canada. And even if it's related to employment or other things. Yeah. So that education piece sometimes is a big gap for, for all of us. So is that something that, uh, maybe we can help uh, at CCMW to push uh, and to advocate for so that our sex education is, is, is full and has yeah. some information on this. Yeah, I would love to explore that. I'm not sure exactly how we could do that um, because like we are connected right now to um, an organization that provides training for young immigrant um, youth about self-image and like, you know, not professional development, but like self-image and like self-development, right? And we're trying to figure out ways to incorporate some of these conversations into that piece. Um, but when it comes to like providing it to everybody, I'm a little bit weary of doing that um, because it's not relevant. It's not relevant to everyone. And then there's that risk of stigmatization if that makes sense, right? Um, but you are right, like young people need to know what their bodies look like, you know, um, what shouldn't happen to their bodies. Um, I don't have the answer of the proper or the most appropriate way to disseminate that information. But like when we go in, I'm, even though like, you know, our topic is like FGMC and like educating on FGMC, I'm always asking myself, why am I having this conversation with this specific group of people, right? 
um, you know, how are, how are they part of the equation? And sometimes they're not part of the equation and it becomes kind of like a voyeuristic, ooh, gawking um, uh, scenario. And I don't want that, right? So because like, again, like there's a potential of harm and I don't want to increase stigmatization. Like I, I like, you know, um, I like, I grew up here in the nineties and the early two thousands. And I remember when I was young, the conversations around, you know, either young black people or, or black people in general or Muslims, right? And it's like the education and like the attempts to talk about radicalization. I remember like those conversations in like the gym class, um, not gym class, sorry, in, in our auditorium, a speaker coming in and then like the whole school is looking at the Muslim kids like, oh, so you guys are this, right? So it's like, I'm weary of doing something similar. But um, the best way that I can think of is like, to work with organizations that are already providing um, youth programming to kids that are from impacted communities and find a way through, you know, sexual education or self image or something like that, rather than like the public school curriculum. Yeah. It's, it's a double edged sword, right? Like, you know, uh, yeah. And, you know, I come from the world of HIV, Varda, so I did a lot of work yeah. around that. And, you know, many a times I found that our strongest allies and people who supported us were really people who were not living with HIV sometimes, but they became such bold and uh, yeah. vocalized, uh, you know, instruments of change that we relied on them to say, you don't have to have HIV, but, you know, as long as you feel for us, you're compassionate about uh, mm -hmm. people who are living with HIV. So they became our big allies, right? So I'm just kind of Sorry. talking in the same context to say, uh, yes, there is a fear of, uh, you know, being stigmatized, but the good part is that we, children are talking about it. They're more aware mm -hmm. about their sexual identities. And I think that's what we want, right? Like, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one of our founders, like we were founded by two individuals. One of them is um, Farzana Doctor, who is open about her FGMC experience, a therapist. And then our other founder mm -hmm. is Giselle. And Giselle is a Caucasian Canadian woman from BC. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we already went over this. So it's like, it's illegal in Canada and has been illegal since 1997. Okay, so this is the end of my presentation, but um, the remaining of the time we'll keep it for questions. So I said, I'm gonna have a call to action. And I genuinely mean that from the bottom of my heart. I believe and I hope that this is not like, you know, a one off conversation that most of you will connect with me um, and we can carry forward this work. So one of the first things that I would request from you is to take our foundation module. I will send a link to Firdos um, and then, you know, she can share it with you. So the foundation module gives you a more in depth information about all of this the what FGMC is and its health impacts um, and it's like you know um, relevancy to in a Canadian context, it takes about 40 to 45 minutes, so we would really appreciate it if you did it. Um, we are a network organization and our network is composed of people like you and organizations like CCMW so i'm requesting from all of you to become members, um, this gives us you know, like I said the weight and like the, the audacity to do the work that needs to get done. Um, and we would really appreciate your voices being among us. Um, if you are working in a place that you feel like our training could be valuable, please connect with me, I would love to come. So like I'm talking to you as an individual, all of you, right? Whether you're working, whatever, you know, the organizations that you're working, bring me in, I would love to do the training. Like I said, one of the things that we're really lacking is, uh, we're really lacking in Canada is, um, places for me to refer people to, right? So a lot of times when people reach out to me so that they can refer their client or their patient to me, my response to them is like, okay, sorry, I don't provide frontline services, but what I can do is, can I come in and train you and your colleagues so that you don't need to refer anyone to anyone again, right? So like you have this competency now. So yeah. Um, I'm currently creating a resource list and one of those is a, a therapist and counselor list so like if you know any therapist and counselors, please connect them with me. Um, I would like them to go through the FGMC training and then I would like to add them to my roster 
And then um, please join our newsletter, follow us on all of our socials and sign our petition. I can send all the links to Ferdos. Um, I, uh, Ferdos sent you, I believe yesterday, right? The pretest for this. There's also a post test. So I would appreciate it if you were able to do those things for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will stop sharing and then I will leave the rest of the evening for questions. Can I just say something? It's Nusat. Yeah, please. So now, now I've changed devices. So now I'm not on my computer, oh, but yeah. here I am on my cell phone. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, we have uh, a really great roster of um, um, some, like resources, uh, so therapists and um, counselors and so on. And uh, one of our team members, Sabrine Azrak, yeah. she, she is the one who responds to requests for help from women experiencing um, gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. So um, that might be, you know, she might be a good person for you to connect with because we, you know, we find resources in the community to help the women who are going through either legal issues or some kind of violence. Yeah. Um, so if you want, you know, that's a, that's a resource we already have. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, we connected with Sabrine at the beginning of our conversations. I remember mm -hmm. that. So yes, okay. I would love to reconnect. What I need to do is kind of go through that list and mm -hmm. you know, for, for me to have like a live connection with them, for me to know yeah. that they know what FGMC is and like they feel confident and comfortable supporting survivors. Well, yeah. another thing we could do, and we've done this previously, mm -hmm. um, we have held um, workshops like the one you just did for us today or the presentation you did with mm -hmm. service providers that mm -hmm. we deal with, that you know, we, we did the outreach to them, we uh, said, this is for you, Mm -hmm. um, so they, they attended, we had a very good response from them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and then we can do some, um, through our networks, we can invite more service providers as well. This time, you know, we, we have mostly like CCMW folks here, but, mm -hmm. um, I think that, that, that's another thing we can do so that among that population, those, those therapists and counselors that are on our roster already there will be more information sharing and they can, you know, they'll get educated about this. So if you like, we can facilitate something like that too. Yeah, I would love that. We have our mental health module launching sometime towards the end of the summer, maybe early fall. So mm -hmm. when that happens, I would love to, or like kind of like in preparation for that, organize with perhaps a webinar or like a training session like this is specifically geared towards mental health professionals. And then okay. we can like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so we can, we can definitely our... do that. Yeah. So so when you're getting ready, just connect with us to mm -hmm. hold that, that session, especially for service providers. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Good. I'm very excited. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions we have from our participants before we end? Okay, I'm going to drop our um, membership form. Yes. Just give me so one So tell second. us a little bit more about, about membership. What does it look like? Uh, can individuals become members? Mm -hmm. Can organizations become members? Yes. So we have two different types of membership. We have the individual one and the organizational one. Um, and membership for us means like that you support us in our work. Um, you know, your voice gives us that strength. But also you we keep you updated on like what's happening um we are organizing um kind of like a membership meetings every six months or like twice a year reconnecting and like understanding how the organization um has been operating so far and like again like as a membership organization we try to take feedback from our members to be like okay what do we need to do and like what are some of the suggestions that you can make for us um, so that's what it really entails. So whether you can put it in the chat, but I think even if you add the document and some details to the email that, that I can uh -huh. forward to all our participants today, yeah, uh, they may have someone either themselves or they want to forward it to their organizational leads um, and you can get some more members <clears throat> that way. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I had it open for some reason. Quick question, do you go into schools to talk about this? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, do you go into schools to talk about this? We can, if you would like to invite us. Uh, I haven't yet. Okay. Uh, we, we used to before, when we first started, mm. um, we've had a few invites to schools. When the, network, when the network first started, we've had a few invites to schools, but in recent times we've not had, and like Warda said, we've been trying to, you know, get all those invites. Warda is doing a very good job to see how we can also get into schools because I see um, in the chat where Fidel's asked if it's included in sex education, it's not, to be honest, because even a lot of people don't know that it's illegal in Canada. So we do go to schools. We feel that this is something that um, students should also know about, especially because of vacation cotton, mm -hmm. so that they can, you know, confide in their teachers. They can confide in the social workers at school. Um, in September, the network is going to be having a webinar for teachers and social workers. If it's something that is also interesting to you, please, you can also join us. But like Warda said, please, if you have links to schools, Warda is very capable to talk to students. And I'm always there to join her for moral support. Yeah. I guess it's easier to, to approach uh, Ontarian schools. In Quebec, you have to go through the school boards. Uh -huh. Getting permission from the school boards for a project takes so long the school year gets to be over before you even hear from them. That's one problem. Oh, the wow. only thing is to go to uh, private Muslim schools to talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's an option. And then you're going to have, again, people who the principal might tell you, no, this is not a subject we want to introduce or um, put before. We, we need the parents' permission in order for us to broach such, such a subject. Uh, they will find, all, let me tell you that in a lot of our Muslim schools, there's a big population of North African mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're not very open <laughs> to discussing different issues. So mm -hmm. one has to have parents permission and then parents will say, what on earth are you trying to do to my kid? Put ideas. So we are up in Quebec, it's delicate. One has yeah. to know how to approach the, the schools. Yeah. Um, next month, I am, so okay, right now I'm supporting a group of high school students who are doing a research project on FGMC. So I guess like this is one way to kind of like work around the school boards and like on the permission, all of that. It was just the students who approached us. We agreed. So they're doing a project on FGMC, a research project. You know we're supporting them with the research and the materials and like all of that right so like they're using our content um and then during their presentation they're going to give me i think like about five ten minutes to come in and like do a very smaller version of what i just did and a q a for the students the student body in their school so you know if you're teachers or you know any teachers maybe this is a, a way that we can work around the red tape and in getting into schools yeah i suppose if it's a uh... Mm -hmm. student led yeah. uh, maybe they'll be more open yeah mm -hmm. but this is this is in the future then yeah this is in uh, ontario these students right. right yeah and it's like approved by their key school and everything right the only way would be through a webinar right uh no um it's like it's their project right so they're just inviting me as a guest but I'm saying if they ever had to talk to a Quebec school, it would be for a webinar. Oh, I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. We can do, like, we can, we organize webinars and we organize trainings like this, where, like, it's more participatory, like, more like a workshop. <clears throat> And I think there are lots of opportunities like through, uh, you know, uh, teacher, parent, teacher councils and, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of schools that we have worked with. Uh, also, there are two, at least two school boards, the uh, Toronto district and the Peel that have embraced the anti-Islamophobia strategy. So, you know, through them, uh, mm -hmm. we can navigate the system and, and try to get these because this is such uh, important information, both for teachers and students, right? Like if teachers yeah. come across an incident, um, I have a son who's a teacher, 
and I think Nuzat, uh, Nuzat has a daughter, but sometimes my son at least struggles to say, I see this, but we don't, we are not trained. We don't have these uh, resources. We don't have uh, things that tell us how to navigate and what to do next, right? Like, so uh, in a way that these trainings are good. So keep in touch, Varda. I think that through CCMW and the amazing individuals that are here today, a lot can be done and achieved and uh, we are with you in this good fight uh, whatever we can do to be your allies uh, it is our issue like you know we said it's yeah. a canadian issue uh, let's uh, not other it let's own it to say you know it impacts all of us especially ra racialized women mm -hmm. and we can do a lot uh, to prevent it and to support those uh, who are impacted so uh, on behalf of ccmw uh, nuzat iman umema and all my colleagues i want to thank you and um, blessing for such an amazing session i think we can go on and on i still have so many questions but i will take it offline uh, and really this is something that is important to all of us uh, when we talk about women equity and equality and empowerment this is you know hits home we, we, mm -hmm. we cannot let this happen especially in canada yeah. so i thank you for your time and you know this is a time you would have been with your kids uh, i know it's a friday evening so a special thank you from all of us for being here and to all the participants for being so engaged, uh, we have a recorded session. We can send you a link, uh, especially to our chapter members who were not able to attend today. And all the good stuff, Vada, take your time, compile it in one email or multiple emails, and I will send it out to all our chapter members, but also the participants uh, that are here today. So thank you again. Amazing. Thank, thank you, Vada. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye -bye. Thank you so much.